everyone. Welcome to another live stream for History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Professor James Charlesworth, and today we're going to be talking about how the Gospel of John was written. Several scholars believe that the Gospel of John was written in several stages, and at some point, a later redactor compiled these different texts together to form what we now refer to as the Biblical Gospel of John. And so today, James Charles Charlesworth joins me to discuss just that. Well, welcome back to the show, James. Well, uh, what is this, about the sixth time we've been together? Yeah, I think that's about right. And, uh, but yeah, great to have you back again. And uh, let's get right into it. Well, it's when... a wonderful time of year as we get toward Easter and uh, Pesach, uh, Passover and Easter. Passover was last week. The second Passover is coming up. So we're in between the two, the Israelite Passover and the Passover outside of Israel. And obviously, many people are looking forward to Easter. And I'm hoping more and more people will take seriously the confessions and the beliefs that Easter often brings. So let's get right into the to the topic. When does the earliest recension of the Gospel of John date? In, in, in our words, when does the earliest version of it come to be? Well, I think we first have to distinguish between two types of readers. The first type of readers are those who focus only on the English translations of the Gospel of John, notably the 1611 King James Version. That's a long time ago. And do not, and do so meditating and worshiping. The second type of reader are the scholars who have spent decades studying John in the Greek with an eye also on the Aramaic sources and the substrata, substrata in John. One thing we'll be looking at is there are many layers in John and they're chronological and it gets very exciting. Let us start with sources. The lowest stratum, that is the oldest source, maybe in the New Testament, but certainly in John, is what we call the sign source. Uh, notice how the miracles are called signs in John, and they are numbered. But the numbers seem separate from the miracles that are performed by Jesus. That is, they are from a source used by the author and numbered and called signs to celebrate Jesus as the Messiah. Now, let me help you understand. Let's look at John. In 2.11, it says, after many miracles, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana. Now, that seems very strange. What we have concluded after 200 years of research is this is a sign source, and it begins with the first sign or miracle Jesus performed was in Cana of Galilee. But in John, there are other signs, there are other miracles before it. So we think we have a source. Now, stay tuned. In John 4.54, after other signs and miracles, this was now the second sign that Jesus did. So we have numbered the first one, the second one, and it seems from a source. And then finally at the end, that is John 20, 30, it says, now Jesus did many other signs. In John, Jesus' miracles are signs of who he is and who sent him into the world. He is the son of God according to this source. So it's a very early Galilean source. Now, some scholars think it may have been written during the time that Jesus was preaching and performing miracles in Galilee. I don't know myself how old it is, but Jesus is crucified in 30, and this is long before 50. Nothing else is written. About this time, you have the epistles, but not the gospels. Obviously, I mean the epistles of Paul. Now, let us look at John. 
in the eyes of so many critics and ordinary people, which doesn't mean the ordinary or poor or unintelligent, but the normal people, uh, even brilliant people, geniuses, they, uh, they find John the most revelatory gospel. To me, it is the most incredible gospel ever written. We've got about 35 now. Four are in the New Testament canon. But you know, we have to realize that when we look at John, we're getting evidence that there, we're looking at different editions in this one edition. Now, some experts claim there are five editions of the Gospel of John. As I said earlier, these are scholars and critics, not the ordinary reader that reads John as if it was written in 1611 under King James in the King James Version. Uh, and other people that re read the Revised Standard Version. John is one, uh, one whole writing. But that is not what is being taught in Roman Catholic schools, what is being taught in doctoral programs, and what is taught in the introductions to the New Testament in almost all the great universities and colleges. Le I know it's a leap for many people, but let me try to help you. Uh, there are many editions reflected in the present Gospel of John. Uh, first, it is very obvious that John 7, 53 through 8, 11, the woman cult cut in adultery, is an addition to John. Why? It's not in John. What do you mean it's not in John? Okay, it's not in the early Gospels and not the early Greek editions, and it's in the recent translations in a footnote or at the end of John pointing out it has been added to John. We know that John 7:53 through 8:11 is an addition to John because it's not in the early gospels. Actually, if you wanted to spend some time in doing research, I would argue that this is one of the sections in John that's the earliest. That is something added to John can be 50 years earlier than John. And that's, I think, the case. And it probably uh, is authentic. The temple is standing there. People are about to stone this woman. And there are priests there. And Jesus says, "This, the one who is without sin, throw the first stone. That is what is in John 7, 53 through 8, 11. The pericope, regard, the passage regarding the woman caught in adultery. Of course, a lot of people are asking, now, what were we doing? Were, were these people voyeurs watching? How did they say we caught her in the act of adultery? Let's not go that way for the moment. So we know that uh, 753 through 11 is not in a lot of the Gospels, the Greek manuscripts of John, and it was added later, but it could be very early. Second, we have chapter 21 is an addition. That is clear because chapter 20 ends the gospel. And then chapter 21 is an addition to John, trying to bring John closer together to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they look at Jesus' story the same way, with the same eye. John is different. So, the last chapter of John 21 sees a problem with John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it tries to bring it in. For example, Peter is becoming the hero and uh, other things that we point out if we were just working on that. Third, note the Logos hymn in 1, 1 through 18 is added. This is a hymn chanted. It may be very early, but probably chanted. There was no singing until about Ambrose, fourth century. Uh, before that, everything was chanted. And today in the synagogue, when I go, I chant. I don't sing. When I go to church, I sing. I don't chant. So the idea of chanting is very early in Christianity and has, has been there from the beginning in Judaism. Um, okay. Now... 1, 1 through 18 is a hymn, and 
I, I have to say what I think, because if we talked about what everybody thought, we would have chaos. Now, what I'm about to say is what is taught. It's not idiosyncratic to me. The beginning of John began with Jesus and John the baptizer. Then someone added the logos him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made through him, and without him, well, I'm back to the second grade where we memorized the gospel of John, and we're so excited. It was a public school. That takes you back to the day when we would begin with prayer, we would begin with prayer and reading the Bible, and uh, people had values. People knew about religion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the critique was right. Too often it was forced down the throat. Now, as I will try to show as this program continues, we are allowed to say what we believe, wh whatever we are, Baptists, Catholics, Methodists, Jews, atheists, and that is what America is, where we come together as a melting pot and say what we believe, and we're not condemning or saying, if you don't agree with me, you're going to go to hell. Let's hope that that's behind us. That doesn't mean that any one of us has perfect truth. But when we talk with one another, we can get a better appreciation, a little more humility, and ask God for clarification. God knows everything. Many of us know a lot, and we admit we don't know everything. So the hymn at the beginning, 1, 1 through 18, is the Logos hymn, and it uh, has this wonderful passage, and the word flesh became. That's how it should be translated. Kaho Logos Sarx. Logos Sarx. Word flesh became. And when you put a verb between the two, they're no longer united. It's ascendetic contiguity. The two nouns are put close together, and they're concretized, uh, galvanized, if you wish, and the word flesh became. And that is what the Logos hymn is about, that Jesus was fully flesh. Now, most people say, no, no, not at all. Uh, we will be getting to some thoughts on this, where the early Christians thought that he was just a spirit uh, passing through the world. But John is writing against that. He was flesh. People think to th tend to think, following Stoicism, the spirit, the logos was put in the flesh. No, the impossible occurred. Spirit, logos became flesh. Uh, now, there's another addition, and I'm convinced. When you read up through chapter 18, you'll see a tremendous difference. It looks like chapter 15 through 17 have been added. Why is that? Well, chapter 14 flows into chapter 18. It flows right into it. Notice how chapter 14 ends. Jesus says, rise, let us go hence. Rise, let us go hence. Then chapter 8 begins with this passage. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kedron Valley. Kedron Valley where there was a garden, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now, I am convinced, perhaps not as convincing as some other passages, like chapter 21, that conceivably this was added later. So then I read through chapters 15 to 17, and what do I find? It's a reflection of a much later date. Why? There is a need for Jesus to urge, stay together, remain together like branches of a vine. And in chapter 16, Jesus urges his followers to resist falling away. Don't fall away. And warns about being killed and being cast out of the synagogues. We know this doesn't occur until about the 90s. Now, we do know that Stephen was stoned, but that was an exception. Uh, he was stoned by what he claimed, not because he claimed Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, this gets a little bit complicated, but you have to go into Jewish uh, jurisprudence 
to claim that someone is the Messiah is not a punishment. You you don't deserve punishment. But if you make claims about the person, that he's God, that he's a judgment, and if you don't believe me, you're going to go to hell, then you can... There are rules for stoning such a person. So I think that uh, uh, chapters 15 through 17 look to be a late addition to John, but I'm not convinced as I am with John 1, 1 through 18 in chapter 21, and maybe even pap the passage I mentioned uh, between chapters 15 and 17. Uh, I hope that's helpful, and I hope you'll forgive me for getting into details, but you are exceptionally gifted in asking the key questions. What's, what's your next question? I just want to say real quick before I ask it. Um, no, I thought, I thought your answer was perfect. Um, but yeah, in how many stages was the Gospel of John written before it was assembled? Or did you already list? No, 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 no. This, this goes a little deeper. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, again, maybe five. Now, because of the vast amount of evidence we have to cover, I don't want to bore our listeners. So let me go directly to my own opinion. Now, I wouldn't be offering it if it was idiosyncratic or not accepted. I'm trying to say it's my opinion, but my opinion also is after 50 years and more of discussing these issues in the Vatican, in Jerusalem, in synagogues, in churches, and in what, 40 countries? And I don't know how many universities. I can say that what I'm saying has become basically the position scholars who have given their whole life to these questions have come to agree upon. Of course, you get a little differences. And remember, I don't have to be saying what I said 20 years ago. I don't remember. There are people who can tell me. They have notes. But how can I remember? I am therefore free to disagree with what I have said before. I'm trying to speak as clearly as I can now and to your audience. Uh, now, when we go back to 100, when you have now Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have the, you have the Pauline epistles. We can go back from 100 where the books in the New Testament are taking shape, and we can know by at least 50, 20 years from the time Jesus was put to death, that we have a source. At least 50, but it may go back to the time of Jesus. Sometimes I'm thinking, you know, Matthew was a scribe. That means he wrote things down. Don't tell me there was no one in the group when Jesus taught that didn't write some things down. Now, maybe they wrote some things down and it decayed. Maybe it was destroyed. Maybe a Roman soldier tore it up. Maybe it went up in the flames of Jerusalem. Maybe it was remembered and recreated. We're working with possibilities. I think that's what we have to do. So this is a source that goes back very early. It may go back. It goes back long before John and is called the Gospel of Signs. Now, we just referred to him quickly that there are signs numbered in John, and uh, that is uh, the way we go to get to this point. So at least 20 years uh, before 70, when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed for the very last time, it lays destroyed, you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque and you have the Sharia Sharif, these are Arabic terms for the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. And if your leaders have been following it, there have been horrible riots there just yesterday and today. Uh, it, these are flashpoints. They now belong to the Arabs. Uh, but that is where uh, Jesus worshipped in the temple. And I have gone beneath the Dome of the Rock. People will say, no, no. No one can go there except a very devout Muslim. I was there in the uh, early early 70s and late 60s, and then you could go in. 
I remember going into the Al-Aqsa Mosque and getting on my knees and praying. And I remember going beneath the Dome of a Rock where there's some ancient chiselings, perhaps from the time of Isaiah and Jeremiah and maybe even Solomon. Maybe these are from the first temple. And I sat there and I prayed and said, God, help me to understand. So I've been in these places. Uh, I think I'm okay. No one's going to kill me. I did it before they made rules you could not go in. So I'm trying to tell you, I have been to these places and I have thought about them. Uh, and the temple was destroyed, never rebuilt, destroyed in 70. Now, we know that John knows a lot about Jerusalem before 70. Why is that? Well, he talks about the sheep pool. He talks about the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam was found only about 12 years ago. They were repairing a sewage pipe. And as they did, they found stones and it led down into a big pool. It's the pool of Siloam. Then excavation showed a walkway going right up to the temple. Now, what am I telling you and your leaders, readers? Listeners, this was not known until the last few decades. It was after Jerusalem was burned. Think about it. 30 feet of debris, rocks, bones, the collapse of a whole major city. And now the Pool of Siloam, no one knows where it is. And when we excavate there, I was there during the cold rain and <laughs> I got very sick. I was on my raid way to Rome where I was a professor in those days. And it was so cold in the rain and I was covered. Uh, but I wanted to stay there and I studied it. And it was amazing. In a flat, only a few decades ago, less than 20 years ago, we didn't know where the Pool of Siloam was. Now we know. What does that mean? John describes it perfectly. What does that mean to me? He knew Jerusalem before 70. He knew the sheep gate. He knew the sheep pool. He knew the pool of Siloam. He knew the temple. He could go into the temple. He could worship in the temple. Jesus taught in the temple. So many of these things that were literally lost because of this horrible war began in 66 when the Jews revolted against Rome and it ended in 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, that is quite a story. I've been trying to get James Cameron to work with me on a movie, The Destruction of Jerusalem. And I said, James, maybe we should even do one on the discovery and the hiding of the scrolls. Obviously, the writing of the scrolls, we know where it was and where the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden and how the Essenes hid them. And then some fled to Masada and left scrolls there so we could bring in Masada and then up to Jerusalem. Uh, but you never know. Uh, that would be a dream for me. And I think the world of what James Cameron is doing, he has skills that are beyond ability of even the most gifted uh, 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 filmmakers. Now, we will continue on that uh, basically what I'm saying is that uh, we didn't know how accurate John was until we dug in the last 20 years. There's the Pool of Siloam. We didn't know where it was. And it's exactly how he describes it. Now, let us continue on. I think that when we read Josephus clearly and carefully and yearly after yearly, he says that Titus says in the months before the destruction of Jerusalem, those who were not fighters could take their belongings and leave the city. I have no doubt that as that's when the followers of Jesus, you may call them the Christ freaks, the weirdos, they left with their scrolls, it's not a weapon, and their notes, and maybe a backpack or a satchel full of notes and, and, and realia that comes from the time of Jesus. And where did they go? Uh, the tradition is, so I'm trying to bring what we know from history, from text, from excavations, from writings. Everything says that the Christians went to Ephesus. Now, it gets very exciting. Did John, the disciple, go there? Did he take the gospel with him? 
did he write any of the Gospel of John? What we have to say as scholars, those who conclude that John wrote John do not know how many people named John were in Ephesus. You have John in the tradition. You have John of Revelation, John the son of Zebedee, John Mark, and in the background, John the Baptist. So there are many people named John. So the question is, if John wrote John, which John wrote John? <laughs> uh, it's exciting, but I think we had to be very careful, very careful. If you push me, is it possible, now notice the language, is it conceivable that in the earliest stages of the composition of John, how it was composed and then added and then edited, was any of those people named John? And was that John, the son of Zebedee, one of the disciples of Jesus? My answer is, you cannot say no. You cannot be definitively. What we're doing is finding a lot more evidence in the early writers, the patristics, the people who wrote the earliest accounts like Papias and others. Uh, I, hope, I hope this is exciting to everybody as it is to me. And speaking on uh, Papias of, Heri of Heriopolis, um, what are your thoughts on the anti-Marcionite prologue claiming that Papias wrote the Gospel of John while he was being dictated the Gospel? Well, we've got a lot of defining to do. Marcion, okay? Who was Marcion? And what is anti-Marcion? Uh the anti-Marcion prologues or introductions are to Mark, Luke, and John. If there was one to Matthew, we haven't found it yet. It may be unknown. It certainly is unknown, and it is certainly lost. But a lot of the things I do is go to old libraries and go down to the archives if they let me do it, and I found there the Treatise of Shem which I date about the time of uh, Herod the Great. And uh, we find other manuscripts. I found one on Mount uh, uh, Athos. So I do a lot of searching. And of course, we have the early Assyriac Gospels, which are very different in many ways to the Greek Gospels. And they are, one is Curitonianus in London, and one is the Sinaiticus in Saint Sinai, the Saint Sinai. Uh, now, these anti marcionite prologues can be found in about 40 manuscripts. They're in Latin, and they introduce the Vulgate. The introductions try to explain the place and the order of the Gospels, which came first, which was second, third, and fourth. And they then try to claim biographical details of the evangelists, Mark, Luke, and John, and what sources they knew. They were at one time considered to be directed against Marcion. That is no longer the consensus. We don't call them anti-Marcion now. And they were judged to supply accurate information regarding an Orthodox New Testament canon by the late second century. The conclu this conclusion is now certain, thanks to the lifelong research by Lee MacDonald, the authority of canonization. The canon didn't begin as early as we think, but it can, as Lee has said, it has continued way up into the Middle Ages. Earlier scholars, as I suggested, that these brief inter introductions to the Gospels of Mark and Luke and John were directed against Marcion, who was considered a heretic. Today, we must admit that the origins of these introductions, the origins are unknown. Only in the introduction to John is there a mention of Marcion and an opposition to him. Let me read it to you 
This is the anti-Marcion introduction to John. Nothing like this. Marcion is not mentioned in the other introductions to Mark and, and Luke. I now read. This is a translation by Roger Piercy. The Gospel of John was revealed and given to the churches by John while still in the body. Just as Papias of Heliopolis, the close disciple of John, related in the esoterics, that is, in the last five books. Indeed, he wrote down the gospel while John was dictating carefully. But the heretic, Marcion, after being condemned by him because he was teaching the opposite to him, that is, the opposite to John, was expelled by John. But he, that is, Marcion, had brought writings or letters to him, that is, John, from the brothers which were in Pontus. Now, that's the end of the anti-Marcion section of John. Now, if Papias is the one who wrote John, that report is confused. Papias wrote five books that record Jesus' sayings and Jesus' deeds, I think. Now, all are lost, but I have been searching for them for 40 years. And sometimes they get close, and then I have to come back to Princeton and do other things, as you can imagine. Why is Marcion judged to be a heretic? Marcion of Sinope shook the early church leaders by teaching that Jesus was fundamentally a divine spirit. I hope that is clear. Jesus, who was not flesh and bone, he was a spirit. Marcion continued, he appeared to humans in a human form, but he wasn't in a human form. He was a spirit. God sent Jesus as an entirely new and alien God. That is Marcion. That is heresy. There's Because you begin to hear that the Jewish God is merciless. The God was paradigmatically different from Israel's vengeful God who had created the world. So the creator is an evil God. Now you can say, well, why is there death? God's got to be evil. Why is there sin and suffering? God has got to be evil. That is not what we find in our Bibles. God said, let us make man in our own image and let us give him freedom and that means to do what he chooses otherwise he is but doing what we are making him to do like a little puppet he has no free will free will means you are free to choose the satan as god and unfortunately when you look around the world that explains a lot of things to me it looks like Satan got loose from hell. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be seeing better news, uh, but everything is building up in a kind of negative way. What, what years we're all suffering together? Okay, we will continue. Marcion was then clearly a heretic. Now, the great teachers of the early church that would be Justin Martyr, Hegesippus, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Origen, and Tertullian. These are people that made nothing but A pluses in their classes. All they did was study and write and think and have students. They unanimously condemned Marcion as a heretic. They were right, as we saw. To say that Jesus was only a spirit, he flew around, he could disappear. Uh, now, we're not talking about the post-resurrection Jesus, which doesn't have flesh. We know that, that in the middle of the dinner with Cleopas and his companion, who is the companion? He disappears. And uh, when the disciples are there with Thomas, he appears. Uh, he can go in between walls, in between doors. Now, that's the post-resurrection Jesus. That does not define the flesh and blood Jesus that is stuck on the cross with nails 
or ropes, nails through the feet, probably ropes or nails through the hands. We have found only one man that was crucified, Yochanan, and I have spent my life writing about him and studying his remains. And there is a nail that goes through the two bones when the when the heels are brought together. And you can even see that the wood of the cross is olive wood, probably from Bethlehem. Uh, so these early scholars, brilliant men, thinkers, some of them came to Christianity after hating Christians. And I think you have to allow, and forgive me for this, if I'm being too confessional, I think you'll never understand these traditions if you leave Revelation out. My example would be Einstein, E equals MC square. We can say it. Energy equals map times mass times the speed of light squared. Ah, what does it mean? We all seem to know. I don't know. Why is mass used rather than material? What is the difference between mass and something? Now, E is energy equals mass times C, light, squared. What do you think? Well, Einstein was very clever. He did a lot of homework. He figured this out mathematically. And Einstein was asked by the great scientist, what mathematical formula did you knew, use to make this great discovery? Einstein said, I did not discover it. It was revealed to me. Now, people have not studied John Knox and uh, Th Thomas Newton, and they make the same confession. Now, I think that I would have to say, if I have ever been brilliant, it's because I work very hard. I had the best teachers. I meditate but also I am empowered. I'm not doing it alone. No great musician says I did it alone. Go and do yourself a favor. Check, ask if you can see Mozart's compositions. Mozart is the greatest genius in the history of music. I go over to the university library here in Princeton and I look at them. One line, another line, not one correction. And when I look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, there may be 50 corrections on a page or on a series of lines. And it's because we make mistakes. Why didn't Mozart make a mistake? Who was Mozart? What is revelation? I can tell you right now as a person that's been thinking about this, Revelation is perfect speculation, but the speculation cannot be perfect by an imperfect human being. It's a lot for us to think about. Now we get back to Marcion. Marcion is extremely important because he helped thinkers discern what was important, especially the claim that Jesus became a human, not a fake human, but a real human being. Actually, one of my best students when I was a professor at Duke said, you know, I've been thinking, you've helped me a lot. When Peter stood beside Jesus and Jesus and he relieved themselves, Peter knew this was a human being. I need to recognize that. I said, that is a very interesting thought. I doubt I'll ever share it with anybody, let alone on TV or radio. Oh, I just did. Uh, we, we will continue. Marcion helped us understand the earthiness of Jesus. Just think about John again. Jesus makes it to Shechem. He is too tired. He is worn out. He's too thirsty. thirsty. And a woman comes out and he says to her, can you help me get some water? I'm thirsty. The really human Jesus, he was tired. He couldn't go into the village. He was thirsty. He needed water. That is the really human Jesus that even John 
announces, although John is often seen as the one that brings out the divinity of Jesus more clearly than anybody else. Uh, we continue with uh, Marcion, and I, I think it's wonderful. He forced us to decide what was Jesus like, the real Jesus, the really human Jesus, and what is our canon. Now, Marcion had a, had a canon that uh, is really absurd. When he got to the gospel, he chose the gospel of Marcion, his own gospel, which is a, a really messed up edition of Luke. Uh, now, I would have to say the successes of, successes of Christians today as we come to Easter is due, is due to the confession that Jesus was a fully Jewish human being, a male, and he came in the flesh. Obviously, that allows us to say God sent him. He didn't choose to come. God sent him and that God raised him. He didn't raise himself. Those would be my reflections also to share, but not to force on others. In a world defined by billions of galaxies and Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle, we should pause and wonder, wonder. By wondering, we are closer both to the truth and to the ineffable God, worshiped by all those whose faith is shaped by the disparate and complex biblical traditions. And I'm sure you have another question. How many times was the Gospel of John interpolated before it reached its final form? Uh, for those who have not been trained or influenced by advanced research, the answer is none. It's one. It's a total gospel. It has not been changed. It has not evolved. It has not been edited. But for those who have devoted their lives to studying the, the tensions from one verse to another and from one chapter to another, uh, these are Roman Catholics and Protestants and the few Jews who are interested. The answer is maybe five times the Gospel of John has been edited and changed. And I think that's important because if we say what preachers said during the revolution or what was said before World War I, we will have no hearers. We have to change our language, but we don't change the truth. We change our expression and our understanding of the truth. How my understanding has changed since I realized that we live in a little galaxy, the Milky Way, on an insignificant solar system, and we can see billions of planets, not dozens, billions, and each of these billions could have life. Someday, if it happens that we meet someone who is extraterrestrial, what will that mean? Can we still affirm in the fullness of time, God sent his son to the earth? What is our earth? As of now, I have to say, it's the only place I know where there's life like us. That is intelligent life. But I do know when we study the octopus, and other lives. All life came from the ocean, and the life got into the ocean by asteroids, and these asteroids came from another world. So we are, I wouldn't have said that 20 years ago. Our language, we have to grow, and grow is the most exciting thing to do, especially when you get to be an octogenarian, as I am. I hope this is, has been helpful. We are working with living traditions, not dead stories. Uh, a lot of people have seen Jesus as the man of the future. Isn't that wonderful? The man of the future. He who comes into our lives and says, love your neighbor. He who says, turn your enemies into neighbors. Now, if we do that, we're going to live in a world without enemies. 
Is there a better dream? We have a couple of super chat questions from the fans. Let's start with Thomas Rhodes. Thank you for your super chat. And Luke asks, the death of Judas is put into Peter's mouth by the offer. Judging from the tone, this does not seem like a firsthand witness. The, vid the Vignite is also in John. Was this added later? Boy, this is a very gifted person. Uh, in the Gospel of uh, in the Gospels, we hear about Judas, that he was the treasurer. That's the early tradition. How is it edited? But he stole from the money purse. That is later. That's after he betrayed Jesus. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Who was Jesus? He was the one that chose Judas to follow him. He chose Judas to be in charge of the money. He trusted Judas. What was Jewish? Judas' intent when he led uh, the priest soldiers to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Was it good motive? Did he believe Jesus would twitch his nose and, die, and angels would come down and protect him? We have so much to learn. Those of us who believe someday will be with Judas if he's in heaven, but certainly with Peter and Jesus, will we get more answers? we probably will also get more questions. Let's take the next one. Renzo Rodriguez, thank you for your super chat. R.G. Price claims Mark was written mostly out of Old Testament references and Paul's corpus. Later gospels were based on Mark. Then we hardly know about Jesus. Thoughts? The gospels, all of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are describing Jesus in terms of prophecy. They're writing his life from predictions that we see our prophecies. We don't see them as predictions. They do. And so they write a life of Jesus. Yes, Mark is the first one. Our research on Mark suggests that he may, the early tradition that he wrote in Rome he had been the scribe, the secretary of Peter. And that all makes sense because I've had secretaries and I've asked them to kind of do a draft of a letter. And I think, my gosh, this person is totally incapable of, incapable of writing. And when I read Mark, I realize he's totally incapable of writing a gospel. Why? He uses kaiuthos all the time. That means and immediately. And immediately Jesus told, chose his disciples. And immediately he was going to Galilee. And immediately he came out up out of the water. So Mark doesn't have, and moreover, and therefore, and consequently, and immediately. Now, Mark is our first gospel, very poorly written. Uh, he never met Jesus, had never been in Palestine. So when we get to Luke, which is quite a jump, he says, Inasmuch as many have tried to compile a narrative of those things that have been fulfilled among us, I, I sought, O Theophilus, to, to compile, to check all witnesses and to compile an orderly account of all those things that have been fulfilled among us. So Luke is quite a scholar, and I can quote you in Greek, but that would make people furious. Uh, and he mean pragmaton, very advanced, that was Greek, very advanced Greek, a very, the best Greek we have in the Bible in the first four lines of chapter one of Luke. So he lets you know, hey, I'm a good scholar. I can write good Greek. And in verse four, he says, and when Herod Antipas was, so he lets you know he's working with sorpus, corp, uh, sources. I think that Luke did do what he said. He went to Jerusalem. He probably has stories that no one else has because he talks to people that we know nothing about. He went to Galilee and met people. And I'm sure in Galilee, he met people that believed in Jesus, thought he was the Christ, but don't understand all this stuff about crucifixion. We knew him when he was a teacher here. Uh, we don't know about this crucifixion, and you claim he was resurrected. Why not? We're Jews. We believe in resurrection. That's a great idea. I think God should raise him. So I 
I love to get scholars spinning on a on a, a wheel, you know, when I talk about pre-cross Christology. They say, what do you mean by pre-cross Christology? Beliefs in Jesus before he died on the cross. And uh, I get very interested in that. And I think Luke did is one of the sources. He wants to find out what the first people, inasmuch as many have compiled a narrative, uh, O oh, Theophilus, I want to meet those who saw Jesus and experienced him. I want to write to you an accurate, an orderly, a true account. And so he writes Luke and Acts. Hello, an icon. Thank you for your super sticker. It looks like he doesn't have any questions. Um, so I'll ask my last one. Um, in the go is the Gospel of John. I suppose I'm asking about the final form of it at this point. Is it dependent or largely or entirely independent of the three synoptic Gospels of Mark, Matthew, and Luke? I'm so happy you asked this question because it's a question I ask. Uh, looking at everything, you have to emphasize that John is independent. He has independent sources. But if you ask, could he have known Mark? The answer is probably he did. Mark has been around and he seems to know some things. He may have a few passages where he's influenced by Mark, but he's not significantly influenced. He's influenced by, let's say, the Apostle John, who knew Jesus, who walked with Jesus through the hills of Galilee, was in the temple with Jesus when he was teaching, spent the evenings doing only one thing, talking with Jesus, wondering about God's kingdom. It is God's kingdom. Now, there are a lot of crises he faced. Jesus is arrested. Oh, no. Jesus is put to death. Uh, how is this possible? Jesus says he will return. He hasn't come back. Stephen has been stoned. John gets martyred. That is the other John. The son of Zebedee. The, James and John, the son of Zebedee. There are so many problems. How can the early followers of Jesus keep this faith? All of the followers of Jesus, all his disciples, except the author, except John, the apostle, were martyred. When do you not say, I give up? This was made up. It is not because they died believing. Not one of them said, yeah, we made it up. We didn't think it would cost us our lives. We wanted to be powerful men. No way. They all confessed, Lord, for, they, we don't have evidence that they all confess, but they didn't take the words back. And Stephen said, Lord, forgive them. Jesus said, Lord, forgive them. And that is the message of Jesus. Let us live as forgiving people. And I would say, I'm, I'm a Methodist minister, and I have no doubt whatsoever that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I'm absolutely convinced he did it within a few hours after he died. And when they got there and found the open tomb, it had been open for a long while. What is my source? Jesus on the cross, when he says to one of the men suffering with him, today you will be with me in paradise. That's not a man that lost his faith. That's a Jesus that knows that if even God does not save him from his horrible pain, he will be in paradise before the day ends and the man will be with him because Jesus will forgive him and they will go in together. Obviously, I'm saying a lot of things that shock people. 
but that's what I'm supposed to do. Say what I think and what I have been working on. And this has been a joy for me to be able to share it with everybody. And may it be a time of joyous celebration for everyone, Jews at Pesach, at Passover, and Christians around the world who come together and say, he is risen, he is risen indeed. I would say he has been raised, he has been raised indeed. Well, thanks for joining me today, Professor Charles Worth. It's a joy, and uh, I'm excited by the minds you have stimulated, the sharpness we've heard, uh, very advanced scholars, uh, people. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to be a professor to be a scholar. A mm -hmm. lot of brilliant people do their reading, and they they learn from themselves, and they they have libraries like the one behind me. Uh, God bless you, and may we all feel closer to our ineffable, incredible creator. You too, James. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.